This is Dr. Mariah White, host of Your Life Matters. Thanks for listening to the following broadcast on Public House Media. What's up, everybody? This is Christian Heimel, host of Press Row here on Public House Media. Thanks for listening to the following broadcast on Public House Media. Once you're done with this episode, I hope you'll come check out my show, Press Row, where we talk about the biggest issues in sports with the analysts, experts, and reporters who cover them. No nonsense, hard-hitting interviews on the sports topics you're talking about. A new show comes out every single Thursday. And don't forget to subscribe on iTunes so you never miss an episode of Press Row. Thanks again for checking out the following broadcast on Public House Media. Welcome to How to Write Good. I'm your host, Daniel Poppy. Find out more about me at danielpoppy.com. You can check out everything you want to there. You know what I should put up on my website? Uh, I have a, there is a swag, because that's a word. It's a stupid word. I think I said that before. There's a swag store for How to Write Good merchandise. So if you want something, I have a hat. I actually have to see if the hat's on there. I had to request that. Um, But I hope it is because the hat's a really nice hat. Actually, I'm really, really satisfied with it. I'm actually wearing it right now. It's one of my favorite hats. And not necessarily because it has uh, the show's logo on it, but it just fits really well. I have a really big head. And most hats I run into do not fit my head. I was was visiting some relatives out in Washington State, and I wanted a hat that fit my head because I like getting hats from different places. I wanted a hat that fit my head. And I couldn't. I only found one. Um, and it took a really long time because I kept on trying on different, different hats and none of them would fit my head. So I, I need something with a really big bucket, a really big, um, space for your head. And I found it in that hat and I, I've got a few other ones that fit really well, but most of my hats go down partway on my head and I, I've seen other people wear them, but they don't fit correctly. And I don't like that. I, it feels like it's going to fly off my head. This one fits really, really nicely. So this, uh, there is a, if you go on public house, public house's website, so you can check out this. This podcast is brought to, you, brought to you by Public House. Got to do that. You can check out Public House at thephmedia.com, and there is a How to Write Good um, page, and I believe the store is on the page, but otherwise you can go to store, you can go to How to Write Good. But I need to link the How to Write Good store on my own page because maybe somebody wants something because, honestly, my my logo looks good on anything. I, this hat has a blue blue brim. And it's a baseball cap, and it has the logo. And the logo is actually, it's not just a print. It's actually um, embroidered. It's an embroidery, so it's really, really nice. You can also get a cup if that, if you really, really want that. But the hat is, if you have a big head, if you have a big head, you gotta, you got to connect to the people who make uh, the hat. So what you need to do, if you have a big head and you have trouble finding hats, go to the store, uh, check out who makes it. Maybe see if they sell anything else besides that. And if you don't want, get a How to Write Good hat if you want to. You don't have to. I think you should. The more the better, right? Um, but if you have a big head, yeah, go and see where they get it from or where how it works. And then maybe you can get a hat, not necessarily a, a How to Write Good hat, which you should get anyway, but a different one that you you want if you, if you don't want that. And it'll fit your head really, really well. So uh, we're going to jump in to our word of the week and our word of the week. And I... I I've been using this. Uh, when I write, I reach for words. So I'm like, okay, what am I trying to say exactly here? And this is this is coming to my mind a few times. This is what I've been trying to. Um, this is what I've been trying to. What I've been trying to reach for. So you probably heard of the band Evanescence because um, that is a band, of course, and the. Um, we're going to actually go to the meaning of the word first. So some people, you probably heard this word evanescence, or you probably heard this word evanescent, uh, but you might not know what it means. And what evanescent actually means is is soon uh, passing out of sight, memory, or existence, or fading really, really quickly. So think of it as, um, think of it as, whoops, think of it as the song Dust in the Wind by by um kansas gosh i really like kansas if you have never so most people know dust in the wind i'm getting off track most people know dust in the wind most people know um carry on my wayward son 
There's so many. That's not even close to their best songs. There's so many excellent songs by Kansas. They are one of the most underappreciated bands that I've ever run into, honestly. They're, they're one of the most famous but underappreciated bands. I, I, I don't understand it. So Evanescence, so it's it's something that's going out of its existence really quickly. Dust in the Wind is gone. Uh, it's kind of like a vapor, stuff like that. So um, I guess that's, I mean, and Evanescence, it reminds me of the band. and it, So it reminds me of like late 90s rock kind of stuff which reminds me of stuff like lincoln park but it uh actually comes from it comes from the french well it comes from the french which comes from the latin okay so in the french it meant um something almost imperceptible or something disappearing which is almost the exact same meaning as it is today and the latin means from the latin the latin word was actually evanescera I, i have to read it correctly and that actually meant disappearing. So it's essentially the same exact word. It hasn't changed very much. I think it's really interesting that it hasn't changed very very much. But I think this is probably one of those words uh, that went from... So there's certain words in the English language that jumped from Latin to English. And the reason why they jumped from Latin to English is uh, because they were studied, right? So people started to look back around the... Uh, I can't remember the stupid stupid word uh around the around man it's unbelievable i can't remember the word uh so around the reformation and around the uh the renaissance gosh and happens a lot around the renaissance and so they started looking back to the classical um works and that was kind of the language they did stuff in so they adopted a lot of stuff that's why a lot of that's why pretty much all of medicine bases their terminology off of latin but there's also uh bits and pieces of french so french is essentially latin uh but it's in the french territory so it's it's more uh, provincial and then it's a specific specific dialect of latin think of that and then you add about two thousand years and then you get french or i mean you get french in about i don't know probably a thousand years i don't know exactly but it probably spoke like frankish or something like that but um, you get French. So French is essentially Latin, and it's just ad- adapted to the culture and adapted to how people spoke it and then changed. And that's why Latin, that's why French and Italian, and Italian is the same thing. Italian is essentially just Latin, and then out of 1,500 years or whatever. But um, you take a La- Spanish, Italian, Latin. They're all just fr- – they're all they're a Spanish, Italian – French and they're all just Latin, but it, so what happened is, and I think I probably said stuff similar to this. It, it it came it comes from Latin because French was Latin in some form, and then the French took over a part of England, and they um, and they didn't force the English to change the language. English is a Germanic language, but the English adopted a whole bunch of different things. So that's what happened, and that's why uh, Evanescence went from French and then it went to English. All right, we are going to jump into our accidental essence today. And our accidental essence is something that kind of popped into my head the other day. And I just want to, I want to get it out. And I'm, I actually, so I recorded a podcast the other day. And I'm actually recording this right now. Um, I'm, go, uh, I'm not going to be around for the weekend. And I'm, so I'm recording one ahead of time more than I would typically. Uh, but what I was thinking is I'm, I'm taking a class and the there's this... Um, there is this belief. There's there's two different schools of thought when it comes to writing, I think. There's a and I don't think either of them are wrong necessarily, but I think that there can be two you can be too extreme with either of them, and I think you have to learn from both. There's one that has very rigid rules, which I think is really annoying, and there's one that is I guess more in line in with what I think is you Keep on trying and keep on trying until you get something right. So I'm going to talk about, so the title of this podcast is A Different Language Than Your Father's. And by the end of the podcast, you'll know exactly what I mean by that. But when you are studying a language, when you are a novice in the language, when you are a novice in writing, one of the things people tell you to do is read a lot. Now, what you are doing when you read a lot is you're looking back, right? People have already written that stuff. And you're looking back at what people have written. I've actually in, uh, I'm actually in a, in a, a class about Shakespeare, which I'm just finishing up. Which I mean, I had the podcast last week about it. I'm actually in a class about Shakespeare, 
and the professor made a note to state that oh we should look back at these um we should look back at this writer because he was really really good and we should learn from this writer and we should look at these great writers of the past to learn how to write better now i i um kind of I kind of think Shakespeare is overrated, and I, I don't like people who who fan fanboy fangirl over him. I'm not a typical. I'm not typically a fan of that in general. But I I, I think um, I think to a certain degree that is correct. I think to a certain degree you have to study different people who write things that are considered good at what they do, especially if you're a novice. Because when you're a novice, uh, if you do whatever you want when you haven't done anything already. So if you're learning a language. And you try to write in that language and you think you can do whatever you want, you're going to put a lot of different things in it. But I'm going to get to this in a second. If you, um, if, so if you don't know how to write at all, read a lot because then you get a, a rhythm for the language. You get a rhythm for how people do things. You could just copy them and you could probably write. You could probably, you could probably be passable as a writer. And there's a lot of people who can't write well that I enjoy. Actually, I wanted to say that. So there's not, not, not that they, they don't write well, but they're not phenomenal writers. I am reading. Um, but they may be phenomenal storytellers. There's a difference. I am reading The Wheel of Time. I just finished the second book. And I the, the first one was all right, but it piqued my interest enough to read the second one, which is probably what people are thinking when they read my book. They're like, huh, that piqued my interest. I'm I'm interested enough in the in the first one that I, I would read a second and I'll see where the second one goes. Now, this I read the second one and it was a better story. Uh, Robert Jordan, I believe that's his name who wrote The Wheel of Time, and Robert Jordan is not this phenomenal writer. He's not someone you read and you're like, wow, this this guy's a really, really good writer. He's someone you read and you're like, okay, he's he's an all right. Now, me, that's when I'm reading it. I'm like, okay, he's an all right writer, but I like the stuff he's writing about. So for those of you, this is just a side note. For those of you who think, oh, I'm not that good of a writer, you may have a really, really, really good ideas. Uh, and just because you're not a really good writer doesn't mean you can't put your ideas down because I will read writers who... I would say uh, that that have good ideas but aren't necessarily great writers. Um, but sometimes I won't read writers that are these excellent writers, but they don't have good ideas to put down. They they just write boring stuff. That's why I want to write. That's why I like it writing adventure because I think it's fun, and I hopefully am a good writer. But we'll see. Whatever. Um, so when you are beginning and you're like, well, I don't know what to do. Uh, you don't know where to start. Essentially, if you if you don't know where to start with writing, if you are like, man, I just don't know how to find the words. I would say read because there is a pattern uh, to the written language. There is a pattern that we follow. There are rules. There are rules to the language we speak, right? Therefore, there are rules to the language you write. I, I, I would say that some of those rules for writing do not need to be rules, uh, dangling modifiers. Some of those rules do not need to be rules because the language actually doesn't restrict them. Because I believe we use dangling modifiers within our own speech and people understand them. Therefore, why do we care about them in our writing? Or um, prepositions at the end of a sentence that we talk with, right? Prepositions at the end of the sentence are used at the end of the sentence all the time in spoken word. And they are, and people, um, people understand it completely. There doesn't seem to be any issue with it. But we, at, but people in the writing world say, "Oh, this is an issue." There's, oh, there's other things like that. So there are some issues to be. There are some issues with writing. There are some issues with the rules of writing. But at the same time, uh, the people who, if you read a lot, what you, what, what it does. So you've got people who spent a lot of time writing. You've got people who really, uh, in a lot of cases, studied what they're trying to do. And even if you don't necessarily read uh, the best writing in the world, you're still getting you're still getting a sense of how to put together different things. Uh, I think that when you are first starting to write, you should read and you should read and you should read. I think you should read a lot and you should um, you should fill up a lot of time with with reading. But if you are reading and you are an excellent, like if you're the best writer in the world, let's just say you're the best writer in the world. If you are the best writer in the world, and you read and read and read and read. Well, you're reading people who are are not better, who aren't better than you. You're reading everybody who's worse than you. So, are you going to pick up bad habits from those people who are worse than you? Okay, um, that's the question. So, a after a certain point, I think that you need to break away from the reading of stuff. I, not that you stop reading, but you 
the the way to be a better writer isn't necessarily from reading at that point. The way to be a better writer is actually from writing and trying things out. Um, one thing that I pride myself in that I, I, I may not be the best writer. I may not be a very good writer at all. I, I don't really, I'm not able to assess myself as a writer. I don't think I can. But one thing I really pride myself with is I'm willing to put myself out there and try new things. So somebody may be like, I don't like how you did this or you should change this because this isn't how people write things. I'll be like, well, did I try something new? Uh, did I stretch myself? Did I try, did I try to go out, outside of my limits as a writer? And, um, and if the answer is yes, I'm okay with that. And I'm sure I've said this before. That is what I want to talk about today. So you've got, and this kind of connects back to Shakespeare. So you've got Shakespeare, and we're going we're gonna to connect it to Shakespeare. And I'm going to get my prop of my book that you can't see at all. Right now I'm holding The Merchant of Venice. I have a nice little hard copy. I have read The Merchant of Venice. Uh, I actually enjoy The Merchant of Venice because it, um, quick side note, in The Merchant of Venice, so Shakespeare, Shakespearean plays were all, uh, the actors were all men, which is terrific, and they should still do it with all men. I know that girls want to play the actors in Shakespearean plays, but it would make it so much funnier. Uh, what happens is there are two women who go to Venice, uh, and they disguise themselves as men. So if you are watching this at Shakespeare's time, it would be phenomenal because you have two men who are acting as women because everybody, all the actors were men, and there are two men who are dressed up like women who are disguising themselves as men, which I think is awesome. But uh, Shakespeare... As I was saying in my last episode, Shakespeare is essentially almost com a completely different language than what we speak today. Uh, the way we write today is is very very different. The way we write today compared to the 1700s is different. You can you can or the 1800s can compare some of the writings of people in the 1800s. Say say you're reading um, Mark Twain. Mark Twain writes differently. People wrote differently. There was a more more formality in how they wrote than what they write today. And I would say that Shakespeare, there's a big, big difference between how we write today and how, how we wrote, how people wrote back then. then. Actually, there's such a big difference. And I mentioned this in my Shakespeare episode that if that, that, that people say, okay, Shakespeare is really good. And then like, we should read Shakespeare as my professor did said, we should read Shakespeare to learn how Shakespeare uses language so we can be better writers. But if you try to apply, and I, I seriously think this is the case, if you try to apply different things that Shakespeare did in his writing, someone who is in the literary world would tell you that you shouldn't do it. Now, if you told them it was from Shakespeare, they'd probably say, well, you're not Shakespeare. But if you didn't tell them that it was that it was an idea that you used or, or something that Shakespeare did, they would probably just tell you not to do it, right? If you used a lot of alliteration in your prose, they would probably be like, hey, there's too much alliteration in the prose. It's too flowery. We don't like it. Why don't you change it? Make it really, really plain. Um, now, the reason why this happens and the reason why I, I talked about this in my uh, episode on Shakespeare, so last week's episode, is that the language has changed. The way people write has changed. The way people uh, think has changed. The the psyche of someone from the um, 17th century, the 17th century, I believe, yep, the psyche of someone from that century is different. The, the thoughts, the paradigm they're thinking from is different than people who uh, are from this century. So they're going to write differently. Okay. Now, at the same time, you could say, okay, there's a lot of people in the past and we can look back to their writing and uh, we can learn from their writing. And I think that's good. There's a lot of people who are more contemporary. There's people who are the founding fathers of the United States. There's there's uh, gr great writers that are in American literature. There are people from those time periods. Now, um, yes, yes. As I stated before, if you are a novice writer, look back at the different uh, look back at the different writers in history. Look look at a lot of people who are writing in your own time period, but. Uh, there, from generation to generation, there's a shift in the language. I mean, we call it slang, but there's a different way. Generations are different. My parents are different than than me. How my parents' generation functions is different than me. Uh, the generation that is just one above me, generation. Well, is my are my parents technically in Generation X? I'm not sure. Generation X is different than me. Gen Z is different than me. I'm a millennial. I'll take that. Um, 
there there are different groups of there there's just a different way people function in it okay so what goes along with that is the way people speak the way people function there's a different um the, the word there's a word that's german and a lot of people know it it's very cliche now but it's the idea of a zeitgeist it's the spirit of the times and there's a different spirit within each generation there's a different spirit that's going on within each generation so you could read and i'm talking about people who wrote in the 70s you could read people who wrote in the 70s or or you could even read people who are like 60 years old 55 60 years old around that 40 45 to 60 whatever who are writing now and they're going to write differently than people who wrote who are writing that are my age or people who are writing that are 17 there's going to be a difference in that the reason why um, you should read the books you should find the frame the framework you should figure out what the framework is to write well but what you but every writer at some point I think needs to break from that mold and they need to try to understand they need to try to understand the world from their their generation's perspective in a way like they're trying to take that spirit of their generation and bring it into the writer they are a so for example if you are a boomer if you are a boomer there's uh, I think that you should try to um, capture what it is uh, not necessarily writing about that but, but it's coming out through your writing so I, I think that everybody should do this and if you are a millennial or if you're Gen Z or whatever you are, you are, or, or whatever, I don't know, what what is the generation uh, below Gen Z? I have no idea. Is there a generation below Gen Z yet? If you're that, you should, uh, you have the, you have the right, and I, I think that you have the responsibility as a writer in a way. And I don't really, put, I don't try to put rules on people because I think that, that there's so many people already putting rules on writers already that it restricts them. But I'm trying to free you. I'm trying to free anyone who's a writer up to write in a way that they find is best for them to write in that's very unique. Um, I think that if I am a good writer, if I'm a unique writer, one of the reasons why I am is because I, I was by myself writing and I was just trying to figure it out myself. And I did tons of reading. I, I, I've always been a big reader. I've kind of slacked off in the, oddly enough, I've slacked off in the past uh, few years because I've been busier because I'm an adult and life just gets busy. But as a kid and as a teenager, I read a lot. I read like a book in a couple days. Um, and I think that helped. But even at the same time where I was reading a lot, I was writing a lot. And what I did when I was writing, I experimented a lot. I tried something. Like I said before, I'm really, I don't care what, like, I do care what people say about my work. I want people to like how I write. I want people to like what I write about. But if somebody says they don't like it, as I was saying before, how I judge whether I've done a good job is, did I try something new? Did I stretch myself? Uh, and that's what I was doing as I as I grew up. That's what I was doing as I grew as a writer. And it's been 14 years. Um, I'll just 14 years since I started writing. 14 years since I tried tried different things out. And um, I was going to say something, but I can't remember what it was. And I started with that base where I was reading a lot. I was I was taking what in stuff. I was putting it out, and I was doing a lot of copying, and I was doing a lot of stuff that was derivative. Um, and that's what's going to happen if you are so concerned with the rules that are placed upon you as a writer. So if, you're, if your writing has to be in a very specific way, if you, have to, if you have to follow the example of every single person, like if there's like, these are the excellent writers in history, how is your writing, writing going to be if those are the excellent writers in history? Well, your writing is going to be really similar to theirs. Now you might be like, hey, that's a good thing because they were excellent writers in history. But the issue with it is the language has changed. I believe the language has changed even in a generation. It's it's very, very subtle, but it's different. The language has changed. The culture has changed within a generation. Um, besides the fact that you're an individual person, okay, you have different experiences than everyone else. You are from a specific geographical location. You have a specific beliefs. You have a specific way of talking. Your family has a specific, specific way of talking. And every single person is going to have a different way they write. So yes, you should read a lot. You should try to find those really good examples. You, sh you should try to find people who are really, really good at what they do or you really, really like, and you're like, wow, I'm really caught by their writing. But at the same time, you shouldn't try to mimic them. Um, you, sh you should try to see if you can mimic them. You should try to see if you can speak in their voice, but the ultimate goal of your writing is, sh is, sh is to essentially lay uh, experiences bare in a voice that is uniquely your own which can only come with experience. So that is why uh, this episode is, is called A Different Language Than Your Father's because your, uh, your parents, I'm just putting your fathers because 
in the past this kind of the idea it's like okay like the father our fathers and their fathers before them and stuff like that it's more poetic i guess but um your your parents your parents generation uh they have their own specific style of writing and what your parents generation will likely do and what generations i believe have likely done in the past this is what has happened uh there's a generation uh they there's a university that's formed uh universities have been around since before the renaissance fyi so the catholics are actually responsible i believe for the university system because they were around before they were around before the renaissance because scholasticism was around before the renaissance that's where scholasticism is catholic all this all this all this education comes from the catholics okay this idea of education this this western idea of education the university is, is a, a catholic invention and what they did, I believe, is that there's there's a generation that comes up, and the generation gets in power, and the generation of writers says, "This is how we do things," and the next generation comes up, and the next generation is rebellious because every generation is rebellious, and if your generation is not rebellious, get rebellious, people, seriously. Like, uh, if you're not rebellious in some capacity, especially with your art, there's I feel like you're not doing something right. The generation is rebellious, and the generation above them says, we don't like what you're doing. You should change this, 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 and this. And then the generation below has two choices. Uh, the, the people in the generation below cre creating art, they can be like, yeah, I'll conform to what you're doing. Or they'll be like, no, no, I'm going to stick to what I'm doing. I'm going to stick to how I do something, and I'm going to make something great because of this. And I bet if you want to look throughout – actually, yes, I can. I can look at music with this. If you look at music, now you could say music has deteriorated, okay? The music has not deteriorated. It's, ju it's just folk music evolved, okay? There's always been folk music. There is still classical music in the world. There's always been folk music, and folk music has evolved. So, and folk music is, I believe that um, there, there are, if you are upper class, you identify more with classical music, and you've always identified more with classical music. But classical music is someone highly educated and someone highly involved in the music. And I'm not saying the music is bad. I'm not saying saying it's very, very not not sophisticated. But I'm just saying there is a there is something in more popular music that reaches people. And the reason why it's popular is because it reaches people on a different level than just classical music. Classical music can certainly reach people on those different levels. But there's always been folk music. There's always been people singing. There's always been people singing songs and writing music that is just for a local community. And our local community, we have the capacity to mass produce that, so it kind of gets spread out. So I think there is a, there's always a place for that. Maybe it's overblown. But within the music scene, uh, you had uh, rebels who essentially shifted how the music scene worked. And they shifted it, and they shifted it, and they shifted it. So you have stuff like Frank Sinatra. Right, and I don't know. Uh, after Frank Sinatra, uh, he, when he was still alive, you, you had stuff, people like the Beatles, and I'm not a big fan of the Beatles, but they were doing new stuff, right? Then you had stuff, uh, the Beatles, and, and then you had Pink Floyd in the '70s, and they were doing something complete, like similar to the Beatles, but different. It was still in the same genre, but they were doing something different. And then you had um, people in the '80s, which I don't know what happened there, but it was something different, and that's all right. And a lot of people like the '80s. I had a teacher in high school who thought '80s music was excellent, and then the '90s changed stuff, and actually. Uh, even the early 2000s did something different. They reinvented the wheel, and that's what happens with art. And that's why that's why you can't just rely on, on people who wrote stuff before. That's why you have to do stuff your, yourself. That's why you have to discover how to write yourself. That's why you have to discover how to be a good writer yourself because – the writing is different. The language is different. How you function is different than the people in the past. How you are going to, ex going to express yourself most honestly. How you are going to express your experiences most honestly, uh, most completely. How you are going to express your experiences in the way through writing that is the best is going to be different than your parents. It's going to be diff different than the generation above you. If you really want to get specific, it's going to be different than other people. All right. That is why um, I am all in favor of people going out and trying to figure it out themselves. So that's kind of that's kind of my thoughts today. Um, I I don't know. I, I don't know. I'm almost at the end of my time limit. So, uh, yeah, you can try it out. Really, honestly, you can tell me I'm completely wrong. You can be like, hey, like you need to study these things. And I agree. You should know the rules of the language. The rules of the language do evolve. Language evolves. Language changes the 
Shakespeare is a completely different language. That's why I'm kind of at the point where I think it's not even worthwhile to, to study it, uh, especially for people who are, are not familiar with writing, for people who aren't good writers. I don't know if it's a good idea because you might be shifting somebody in a way that isn't good, but at the same time, they might catch something from Shakespeare. So I'm not even sure. I think people should usually discover art by themselves and take it in by themselves. But yeah, but I think there, that one of the most valuable things, reading has been really valuable in my um, in my journey as a writer. Um, but but the more valuable thing is just being able to do stuff and 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 experiment and find what sounds best. I've always been very concerned with what sounds best. And when I was writing the ninth hour, what I was doing when I wrote stuff is I go over stuff when I I try to figure out the best combination of words to make the words sound the best together, like the flow. Uh, and in a lot of cases, I actually am putting out a supplement to the ninth hour. It's going to be extremely cheap, or I might just put it out for free. Um, there's going to be a hard copy too, but it's only about 100 pages, so I don't know if it's worth it for you to buy it. <laughs> now, if you want the hard copy, buy it. Go ahead. But I wrote that one more recently. So the ninth hour is a book I wrote essentially four or five years ago, and I've been editing and revising it and trying to bring it into a, like a whole book since then. But that is the product of my mind four years ago. And I did stuff uh, differently. And I've been experimenting and trying stuff for those four years. And the supplement is something that I wrote this past winter to go along with it. It actually was going to be part of the book. And I took it out because it didn't fit. Didn't fit. It, it was too long. It, it didn't fit together well. It didn't, it didn't um, run together well. But Within that supplement, I went through things, and I think you'll see it. I tried to get that sound correct, and I focused on it. I'm like, okay, I'm trying to do this. And what that actually, the reason why I'm able to do that sound stuff, the reason why, if I'm, if if you're like, wow, this is good writing, this is put together really well for that supplement once it comes out, if people want to read it, uh, the reason why I was able to do that is because I just kept on experimenting with how sounds were. I played around with sounds. Play is extremely important. In art, I'm, I think play is extremely important because without being willing to try something new, without being just be like, oh, I'm going to just try this and see what happens, you're not going to get anywhere. You're not going to stretch. You're not going to grow. So yeah, read a lot, um, but also just try different things. So we're going to jump over to our logical fallacy. Now, one thing that doesn't change is logic. Uh, logic is logic no matter what. Uh, like I said, there are specific rules in the world, in existence, something... Something uh, can't exist and and not exist at the same time. It can't be exist in the same way in the same manner and not exist at the same time. So there, you can't have specific contradictions um, in the world. For example, I can't um, I can't exist and then I can't I can't be alive and dead, right? I can't be both alive and dead at the same time um, in the same way. So you could you could get all metaphysical and you can get all spiritual to talk about that it, but in in how i'm living right now it can't be the case so today we actually have i see this happening a lot and i think it's really annoying because i think it's i don't think people do it on purpose but i think that it is really disingenuous and i think it makes someone who is actually probably presenting a good argument feel stupid because they feel like they're constant the they're constantly trying to catch up with something and this is the uh, logical fallacy of moving goalposts or shifting goalposts so what this is, is, um, is you state, for example, you state that um, McDonald's, which I'm not a big fan of McDonald's. If you love McDonald's, go for it. I don't care. You say McDonald's is the best burger in the world. And you say McDonald's is the best burger in the world because it has pickles on it. And I give a really good argument for why it, do it is not the best burger in the world and the pickles aren't even good and you're like well the, the the lettuce is really really good and then i give an argument for how their lettuce isn't good and you keep on shifting from one ingredient to the other that's a really simplified version of what moving goalposts are i i actually see this happen a lot um I, I see this happen a lot when people are arguing when people keep on shifting what they're talking about they keep on shifting what is required um for the other person to be correct which is which is disingenuous, which I don't think I don't think people realize they do it, but I think that people should be aware of it. Um, because it is a logic fallacy, it is a bad way of thinking. It doesn't work. All right, that is all I've got for you today. Don't fall into the logical fallacy of shifting gold posts. Read a lot, write a lot, experiment a lot. Try to find that. Uh, try to find that unique way you do things. Try to find that unique way you speak, because that is going to be better if you can do that and you can capture people's. Um, if you can capture people, you've developed a style that is uniquely your own. It's not derivative of somebody else's. And I, I really think that's where really good art comes from. As always, uh, I hope you have a good week. Well, I don't always tell you to have a good week. I hope you have a good week. And 
I am Daniel Poppy. This is How to Write Good.